I'm going to talk about the formation of high mass stars, present and future. Uh, the outline of my talk is as follows. In the first place, I will review the current status of our knowledge about the birth of high mass stars. Then I will mention the key question that uh, we need to address in the near future. And finally, we will present you some of the recent results from ALMA observations. So, let me start for the first part of my talk, uh, telling you, and for the non-expert in this audience, of course, which is the standard evolutionary scenario for a low mass star formation. Uh, you start from a dark cloud with a typical size of about a parsec. Uh, we have some dense core, and this is, we call it a starless phase. Then, uh, in the evolutionary next phase is the pistolar phase, one of uh, these dense cores uh, lose the support against gravity and start to uh, undergo gravitational collapse. Here is a change in, a, in size of about 20. But these uh, have something that tend to a high astronomical unit size and this kind of densities and low temperatures. And finally, if we go uh, another factor of 20 in a uh, in size, which are also, about this, also related to time, of course, we end up with a, in the class zero phase, where you have a protostar, a disk, because of a, this uh, cloud here has some rotation and conservation of angular momentum produces this disk. We, are, we still have some info, and we have the, pro, uh, the pro, it produce some jets or bipolar outflows that carry out a very important the angular momentum which allows uh, to continue with the disaccretion to the protostar and then to the growth of the mass. This is a very well known, it's a paradigm uh, from a model produced by Frank of Forces and Susanna and others and proved by observation very nicely. So the question is, uh, is this paradigm of low mass transformation? I was asked not to move, so I will not move. <laughs> uh, value for the formation of high mass stars, I mean, masses of about are greater than eight solar masses. And the problem is that for massive star radiation, pressure on dust grains may become important to halt this accretion flow that we mentioned at the last stage of class zero. And for this kind of stars, uh, well, it, it, when the ground pressure, uh, the ratio of ground pressure to the ratio of pressure is less than one, which is happening for this kind of star, for massive star, then of course you, you halt the collapse. So the question, of course, is how did you form massive stars? You know, how the masses assemble? Well, there are two models. Uh, possibilities are coalescence of intermediate mass star in clusters. For that, you require high density of a uh, lower mass star, typically greater than uh, 10 to the 8 stars per cubic parsec, or accretion. Uh, the requirement here, then, is that uh, you have high mass info rate to reverse uh, here the ratio and have that greater than one. And for that, you require mass info rate of about 10 to the minus 3 solar masses per year. Or also an accretion through a disk. So let's go and see what we currently know about massive star formation. Uh, I wanted to mention that it's mainly uh, drawn from observation with moderate angular resolution, typically about 10 to 20 arc seconds. So let's, let me tell you what is, we know about the physical characteristic of the region harboring dark massive star. Several surveys, both in the molecular and emission and dust continuum emission, here are the authors, have shown that high mass young stellar objects are found without, within molecular structure with distinctive physical parameters. As an example, we'll take the survey by, by a continuum survey by Paundes to illustrate this. Uh, it was a survey at uh, 1.2 millimeter to 150 luminous iron sources with colorful ultra compact age regions, and they show also CS emission implying that they have high density gas. And here are the examples of uh, this uh, result from the survey. This is a map, the region that were maps about a few minutes, 10 minutes typically, and where the iron source was, you always found uh, 1.2 millimeter source. This is an example here and here. So in fact, the detection rate was 100%. 
all other sources are associated with compact results. But it's important to recognize that this is at the resolution of 24 arc seconds. Which are the parameters of these compact sources? Here I show you the distribution of the parameters, uh, radius, mass, temperature, and luminosity. And they have an average of uh, typically sizes of 0.4 parsecs. The mass of these structures are typically 5,000 solar masses. The densities are 2 times 10 to the 5 particles per cubic centimeter. Column densities of uh, this order, 5 times 10 to 23. And that's temperature to K. This is because this is an iron source, so we know that there was something heating there. And this is our heating by luminous star. So this is the temperature in that sum. As an example, I've also shown which is the parameters that were derived from molecular light observation, in this case from a sample of uh, 150 massive star formation associated with water masses, observing the CS5 to 4 line, very high density tracers, and they found very similar parameters, sizes of 4.5 parsecs, etc., very similar parameters to which they were derived from the dust continuum. What's important here is that they also have, in this kind of thing, the line width, and the line widths are quite large, six kilometers per second. This is the work by Plume et al. So, the conclusion here is that, as I told you, high mass stars are forming regions with distinctly physical parameters, and I call you, or we call it, massive and dense clouds. What about the physical structure of this massive and dense cloud? Well, first, the density structure. Uh, the radial intensity profiles indicate that the density depends with radius as a power law, with a, a power index of a, an average of about 1.7. And this means that these massive and dense clouds are very highly centrally condensed objects. What about the dynamics of this massive and dense cloud? Well, Diego Margones analyzed the CS2 to line to have about 640 of these massive star formation observed by Brofman, and he found that uh, self absorbed profiles are rare. So most massive test scores are approximately in equilibrium, serial equilibrium, as also uh, concluded by Plumerol. And since the gravitational energy is much greater than the thermal energy, we need considerable amount of non-thermal support. And possible mechanisms of support are magnetic field, and you require for this kind of uh, molecular structure about one milligauss, or could be turbulence, and you need turbulent velocities of about four to five kilometers per second and must be continually generated. Or alternative as a lead cell, tall as massive dense cloud could be a transient structure. But 8% of this uh, in the sample of Margones uh, show self absorbed profiles. In fact, four of them show signature of expansion and four signature of inward motion. I show you an example of this. Uh, if you have some source that uh, have this profile, this is a light profile, so it's a spectrum, in this case from a main isotope and the main molecule and the isotope, and you have that the profile show uh, two peaks with a strongly blue shifted peak in an optical thin line, but in an optically thin line, you see only one line that is centered at mainly at the deep. And this is very nicely shown by many people, Phil Myers and Margaret and others. This is, in fact, uh, what you expect. you expect when you have large scale inward motion. Then you expect this kind of profile. And in this case, we have it in, in two lines, as you see the same. So uh, we have again 4% of these massive dense clouds that are observed by Margaret, and they're going large scale in falling motion. So those are the imperial well, that's why I'm not in middle equilibrium, right? They're collapsing. Right. So, where are these massive and dense clouds located? They are usually found embedded in filamentary infrared clouds. Here I have an example of that. Uh, this is uh, from the survey of uh, done with Atlas Gal at uh, 850 microns, or 47 millimeters, where you have this beautiful filament. Uh, this is, in fact, in the infrared, or infrared dark clouds. So, you see here, um, very nicely, that speed observation, these are infrared dark clouds. And the massive and dense clouds are located, in fact, in these uh, filaments. Okay. 
So as a fact, here has a research of the meter uh, service that showed that filaments are ubiquitous along the galactic planes. This is a not rare, and you have here the results of uh, this survey, Kirchhoff survey. Kirchhoff has been very important to prove that. So filaments are central to the formation of compact and dense cores, which is at the location of high column density that are most likely to flatten. About 10% of the massive dense core appear as isolated structures. Like I told you that many of them are sort of in infrared clouds in filaments, but 10% are isolated. And one uh, nice example of uh, this IRA source, uh, here is a, a, an image of the 1.2 millimeter dust emission. We have a here uh, isolated structure with a diameter of about one parsec with mass from just that observation of about 2,000 solar masses. Uh, if you go and look at the IMSX uh, image at 8 microns, you have that in about that area. And not surprisingly, as you see here, a very nice uh, feature in silhouette against the background from uh, at 8 microns. No? So it's a, so, a social feature in silhouette. And not surprisingly here, that exactly corresponds to that structure there that was observed at 1.2 millimeters. It's a contour level here. So this is a now it's an infrared cloud, just not an optical infrared cloud, meaning that the absorption is very large in this structure of about 100, a very, very high density. So this is, a, of course, it's an isolated and ideal place to investigate the process of massive star formation. Uh, what about how, uh, how, which kind of uh, massive and dense cloud we find? I mean, do we find some uh, clouds in different evolutions? Stages, what we want here is to see from the early to the late stage, like in the case of ma low mass star, uh, are there starless uh, massive dense cloud, pre-stellar high mass, and we will see that there are, in fact, this means hypercompact H2 clouds, or clouds with hypercompact H2 region. So let's look at that individually. We found starless massive dense cores. The signatures, observation and signatures are uh, 12 millimeter sources. Some millimeter sources, meaning that they have enough mass, some sort of solar masses, but no radio, no mean infrared, no far infrared counterparts. They are just targets. So, one well, nice example is uh, this one. This is a map on, uh, from the survey of Faundes. This is the area source that he was uh, looking for or pointed to. And this was the map at 1.2. A 1.2 emission is a message just of the mass. No? The flux density is proportional to the, to the mass. So if you want, here you have an image of the mass that is in this region. And when they compare with uh, MSX data, it's a three color image uh, from this uh, wavelength range. And if you want in the MSX, you have in fact a map of temperature. And here is at the contour of the mass and the, the temperature. And of course, you immediately recognize here. There is something with a lot of mass, but no temp low temperature. Okay, so this is in fact a starless massive dense core, but you have to prove it's a massive core. I mean, you have to prove how much mass is there, and they did or we did a CS2 to one observation. This is a very compact core. This is a map of the CS5 to four emission. This is the line profile. Uh, we end up deriving a, a size of a 0.3 parsec density. Compared to the massive dense core, large line width, uh, middle mass of about 900 solar masses. <laughs> and, but the temperature is much smaller because, of course, they won't have an energy source that is heating the dust. They are in the found the sample was 32, but here is less than this, in fact, 15k. I have used, in fact, now the Herschel data, and we have now a very nice uh, value of that, much better value because this was only with one point. But now we have about five, five or six points, and still this hole that the dust temperature is about now 15k. So, that's what the first uh, discovery is done, this massive dense core, but hundreds of them have now been discovered by the Atlas Cloud Survey, which is a survey at 0 0.87 millimeter. And here the, you have one of, oh, sorry. Here you have uh, many of them, okay. I have pointed out that they have already discovered. So the conclusion is that the core massive dense core are the initial condition for the formation of mass star and cluster at the large scale, of course. 
when our pre-stellar well, mass event for, well, the signatures will be the following. They should be, again, 12 millimeter sources, I mean mass. They should be luminous in the medium infrared, far infrared. They should not have radio vision because, I mean, there is still not a stellar source in, in the enzyme and should show evidence of inform motions. As seen in the last example, this IRA source, which is shown here again, a map of the 1.2 millimeter emission. Uh, this is the same, but I just to show that the two uh, closed wavelengths, they have the same structure, beautiful thing. And this is isolated massive and dense clamp with this kind of size, 0.4 parsecs. The mass from the dust is 2,000 solar masses again. The luminosity of this source is two times 10 to the fourth luminosity of the source. It's very luminous. So it's like something there. No? But the flux density, the radio, is much smaller than you expect from this luminosity if there was an, uh, a normal OOP star. For, for that, you will expect perhaps 100 times larger than that, 20 milligrams. So, no radio emission. So, this is in fact a pre stellar massive and dense core, and of course, the luminosity then will come from the fact of the accretion flow. Uh, for the same source, uh, you see that uh, we have uh, spectrum in the CS line and the AC, HCO plus line. And again, they show exactly what you expect uh, the signatures now from infalling gas. So the gas here is also infalling at the velocity of about one kilometer per second. It's not a free fall, but it's just an infalling, slowly falling cloud there. So large scale for motion with velocity in this case was about uh, 0 0.5 kilometers per second. And the mass infall rate is pretty large, it's about 10 to the minus two solar masses per year. So, massive and score in an early evolution chain undergoing intense accretion phase. This is, uh, this is the second phase. No? And the, the, the non existence of radio emission is perhaps because uh, the, the intense accretion phase quenches the development of an ultra compact H2 region, as has been shown by Walsley. Just have the velocity here, I mean, for that kind of mass and radius. We expect uh, info velocity of about 5 kilometers per second. So, uh, because we measure, I mean, this is derived from a simple model. Of course, this uh, velocity is different from the profile. So, what about, uh, what do we know about the massive dense core with high mass potential objects? Well, the signatures are the following. Strong millimeter sources again. It should be luminous again, uh, because of the info. It should have weak radio emission and associated with jets and outflow. The protostellar phase, if you want, this is a class zero phase counterpart of the low mass stars. Uh, well, we look at that, and here's a nice example, the source IDA 16547. Here you have a map of the mass, if you want, 1.2 millimeter and 0.87 millimeter, quite isolated, one parsec. Well, in fact, the size is a 0.2 parsec. Mass is about a thousand solar masses. Five luminous, six times 10 to the four solar luminosities. And again, the radio emission is not uh, at the level what you expect from uh, for this luminosity. It's of about five billion as you expected for that source, uh, about 100 billion if it were a normal all star there. It's associated with a jet. This is shown here. Uh, we have a, a map at a 4.8 gigahertz done with ATCA on the same region. <laughs> And you have a central source and two uh, aligned sources or lobes. Okay, and the central source, in fact, has a spectrum. In the spectral index, this is flux density versus frequency that goes to a, uh, increases with a frequency as a power of 0.6. This is a typical example now for a thermal jet, almost a textbook. Okay? So this is a thermal jet. We all have the resolution here. And in fact, we found that uh, these lobes are non-thermal. So this is a shock cast, uh, shock uh, from the jet uh, that's impinging on the molecular cloud and producing this non-thermal lock by something that we mentioned yesterday by Romero. And it's also associated with a, a collimated bipolar outflow. We did a few observations on the T2 line with apex. And we have a beautiful bipolar outflow. This is our Blue shift velocities is a range from minus 60 to about minus 40, and there's a gap of uh, 20 kilometers per second if you want for the ambient gas, and you have the red from minus 20 to zero. So this is a very high velocity, but very nicely collimated 
uh, a massive and energetic flow. No? The mass of the flow is 500 and tensile masses, and the kinetic energy on the, on the flow is about 310 to 47 hertz. So it's a very massive and energetic. Not surprising because I believe this is a very luminous source. So yet, the, the, the summary here are far associated with luminous strong stellar objects, which is almost not clear. The most interesting case or well-known case was uh, the case of uh, Cepheus A, uh, source number two, with that luminosity. Uh, well, here's a flux density versus frequency, and uh, size versus frequency, in this case, should increase, and uh, the uh, size should decrease with the frequency with that power. So this is a textbook case of this uh, jet. And we have another one now that is associated with an even more luminous star. I think it's the most one luminous node, 7, 10, 12, 4, where you have a thermal jet, and in fact you have five logs. One, one pair here, and a second pair, but these are all related. And in this case, the, the spectrum of the power law of this jet, the frequency, both with a power law of 1.1. So this is a, a, a thermal jet. So, these jets have high velocity, uh, but it was important perhaps here only to read this. There are thousand times more luminous and energetic and low mass, star, low mass jets. Here I put the momentum rate versus the jet luminosity, and this is the Loki of the low mass, I mean the low mass star, and this is the high mass jet. So they are, oh, well, this is our three order of magnitude in the momentum rate, and you see also in the jet luminosity. So they are much more luminosity, so this is not the case that we have a massive net score and a low mass star embedded there producing an outflow. No, this is a, certainly driven by the uh, high luminosity source there. So you associated with luminous chunks are very uh, powerful. Also, my polar co uh, molecular outflow is common to a high mass protosphere object. This has been shown by these, uh, these people. They are energetic, they are collimated and have high velocities. I wanted to mention this source because I will show you at the end of my talk again, where they have the CO profile with a line with full width at zero power of 170 kilometers, which is also seen basically in the SIO A to 7 transition. So the average parameters of the flow, uh, 60 solar masses typically, mass of flow rate about 10 to minus 3 solar masses, and you can read this kind of uh, other physical parameter, mechanical force, and mechanical luminosity. And again, the important thing here is about 100 to 1,000 times more massive and energetic than low, low mass outflow. So now what we know about the massive dense core with hypercompact radio sources, so it's a later stage. Well, they have a signature strong, again, millimeter sources, the mass. They should be luminous. And the infrared and far infrared are associated with hypercompact H2 regions. Uh, I recall you that hypercompact H2 region are the youngest and the smaller and lesser regions of high gas excited by UV photos emitted by embedded luminous high mass stars. And they are probably early, very early stages uh, since the, uh, the uprising of the UV photon output. They have a radius of about uh, less than 0.1 parsec, high electron density, higher than 10 to F5, very high emission metric, greater than 10 to the 8 parsec centimeters to a minus six, and broadly combination lines also. And, well, as I told you, give information about the process of high mass suspension right at the time of the uprising of the UV photon flux. So where are IP compact is really located within massive and dense clouds it is very important because the location of uh, these things uh, can tell you something about how they are produced. That is an important question. And here I have uh, two examples, uh, three IRA sources with hypercompact. In fact, the, the quantum, the grid quantum, corresponds to 1.3 millimeter emission. Okay? And you barely see an, an image. This is an image, in fact, in, in, what they see is an image of the radio continuum emission at 4.8 gigahertz made with ATCA. And the hypercompact regions are right here, right there, and right there. So they are typically found at the center of massive cores. Okay? They are not, uh, this is the most common place in 95% of the cases that they are found right at the center of the core. Whether massive stars are formed there or migrate there is still an open question no? because if you have some dynamical interaction and rapidly click, kick this, the, the protostar to the center. A gravitational focusing. 
So what about the credulous passive star, which are the hot molecular cores, several surface of a molecular lines in high excitation transition, show the presence that, uh, of hot molecular cores, and this is our common phenomena to our massive star forming region. These are the main uh, things. Here's an example of on that source. We have the almost uh, ultra compact case to you. Here, an image of the ultra compact case to you, the radio continuum emission at 1.3 centimeters. And here's a something that is emit uh, in ammonia 404 or methanol cyanide. And there's no associated with radio source, but it's right there. You know? uh, and this is, in fact, then a hot molecular core. And these are supposed to be the cradles of the well, we know now the cradle of a massive star. There we, I call it the maternity, the big picture, and now we are going and individualizing the, where exactly they form. Uh, the characteristics are the following. They have sizes that are less than 0.1 parsec, high temperature, higher than 100 K, very high density, greater than 10 to the 7 particles per cc, masses of typically 100 solar masses, and large luminosities. The heat source is a radiation from embedded high mass giant cellar objects. And several do not show radio continuum emission in spite of large luminosities, as I told you, because perhaps it's quenched due to the high mass infrared. And they show rich chemistry. Perhaps, due, well, not perhaps, but just due to the high temperature, you have evaporation from ice mantle, and then you have a complex phase chemistry, and you see a beautiful spectrum. Perhaps I will talk to you at the time. Okay, what about disk around John Massista? Remember, I, I'm telling you what we know by now. Well, uh, a picture synthesis uh, observation of molecular line show a handful of disks only, of rotating disks. I would say a handful of extended, extended structure, rotating structure. And these are the results that are known. Uh, so there are very few. No? And perhaps it's because of uh, when you start with the UV luminosity, on the protostar, when they reach sort of a you know, B0 masses, they quickly photo evaporate the gas and then they photo evaporate the disk. They get rid of the disk. Uh, I show you that, but uh, the characteristic of this disk are the following. As you said, we have a star. They have radius of about 500 to 2000 astronomical units. They are large, massive of from 1 to 20, very high densities, and the kinematics are not very well known. It shows some rotation, but we all know it's the player of self gravitated in most of the cases, if not all of the cases. Well, all magnetic fields, yes, they are very important also here, and I will have to go quickly. Um, magnetic fields is the, the term of the polarization of radio emission on jets. This was already mentioned yesterday uh, on this uh, jet HH8081 Herbihar object, and here you have the the polarization vectors no? perpendicular to the jet axis, which implies that the magnetic fields are in the direction of the jet. And what's important here from this, I mean, from, uh, that magnetic fields are very important and existent and they are very intense. The magnetic field that you have here is 0.2 milligram. So, magnetic fields indeed are also important in high mass star formation. So, now to the next topic, which are the key issues to be addressed in the near future. Okay. Uh, with respect to starless and pre-stellar massive dense core, we still really have to define it very well with high resolution, which are the initial conditions for massive star formation, meaning we do know, we have to know which the density and temperature distribution to see if they have gradient, which is really the mass distribution. Uh, do we have clumps? Is it fragmentation important? How much multiplicity do we have? So we need to do that at a better angular resolution, of course. This is a thing that we have to do now with our wireless telescope. And short spacing is, important, is essential, no? To recover the whole emission and see how much it is in club and how much perhaps is in an extended but homogeneous uh, medium. So to discern between the two contending models about massive star formation, we are the core accretion and the competitive accretion. Uh, in the core accretion, what is a, this is a massive turbulent core collapse to form an individual massive star. This is sort of the counterpart of the low mass thing. This is the model of core accretion. And this predicts that the core is near the middle equilibrium. In the competitive accretion model, that which Lee likes more, 
you have fragmentation of the massive cloud in protostellar seeds, but with masses of about the gene masses. With for, for this condition, are probably less than one solar masses. Uh, and this fragment has to be in severe condition to have the competitive accretion being efficient. So, but uh, we have to prove that. So this is important then to, again, uh, get a, uh, the density and mass distribution in this massive and dense core with high angular resolution. Determine the cloud mass function, how that depends with the airport environment, with density, or uh, so the surveys of different regions are required. You wanted to see how they depend with the environment, of course. And you need to have a, a link between the cloud mass function and the star mass function, the third mass function. Certainly, that needs still to be done. We have to search for inform motions. We have to measure the motion associated with gravitational inform, but in the scale of about uh, less than 100 astronomical units, uh, which are implies we will now then derive the rate of mass inform into the, onto the disk. Um, we have to understand which is the real role of filamentary structure in massive star formation, and how is the mass reservoir connected to the core? So how is how do you really make from the filament? How do you produce the core? And we produce the core, which uh, Lee has already gave some hints. What about jets? Well, the main question that we have now are jets launched and collimated. Perhaps some of the people here know the answer. I'm pretty sure Frank will like X wing. Well, we have, could this is an X wing? No, it's very close to the star at the end of the, this disk. Or is that disk wing? Or is a hoop stresses? Well, we have to prove all this region with a angular resolution of about 10 million seconds to prove it's about 10 astronomical units where the launching zone is supposed to, to be. So we need to do that, and we still do not know it, but of course, ALMA is coming online very soon, or has already come online. So how is the angular momentum transfer from the accretion disk to the jet? That's very important. So we have to observe the velocity structure perpendicular to the symmetry axis. Do you have it? This is also important. Do you have to really carry angular momentum? Uh, we have, perhaps we can uh, answer that by observing recombination line uh, emission from ionized jet. But about outflow, what we need to know about flow? Well, which is the driving mechanism of massive outflow? Is it uh, entrainment by a turbulent jet? Is it momentum driven by highly collimated jet? Are uh, magnetically diverted flow? Well, well the, the answers are not clear yet. Uh, what determines the open angle high mass outflow, something that you mentioned, but high mass outflow looks to, seems to have larger opening angles than low mass outflow. So it's important to determine how that. Does the underlying wind then consist of both a wide angle wind and a collimated jet you know, that will produce a higher opening angle? That's something that we have to prove again at the scale of uh, 10 to 100 astronomical units. Disk. Well, we have to still find the evidence for a 100 astronomical unit accretion disk and a rotating torus. So we have to measure the velocity structure and mass distribution uh, of protostellar accretion disk, and that will give us the dynamics and rate of accretion from the disk. In other case, from, from, the, from the whole uh, cloud, from the envelope. We see the nature of a uh, hyper compact two regions, so we have to understand that. So, uh, Iquito has, uh, predict, has uh, proposed that these are uh, accretion flows, where the ionization equilibrium radius, or the stronger radius if you want, is smaller than the gravitational radius, which is the radius for escape of uh, the ionized gas. And the ionized gas cannot expand. No? So, if you want, this is a gravitational trap H2 region, or could be that uh, these are evaporation, uh, photo evaporating disks, you know, producing this uh, hypercompact region where you have the Keplerian uh, sequestral disk, mass luminous charge accelerated object, producing this hypercompact uh, A2 region. Still, it's not clear. It has not been completely proved. So, those are uh, a sample of the many, many, many questions that still are open there, particularly for young kids. There's a lot of things to do, wonderful things to to answer. Then I will present some recent results from our observation because I will be very uh, quantitative, uh, quantitative, sorry, qualitative. 
because I mean, this uh, data has been, uh, in some cases, given to us only, the last one was on Friday. <laughs> so I will just show you what we have, we are getting with the ALMA. Well, this is another our work by the Pareto team. Uh, this is a infrared cloud. The five five thousand solar massive impact infrared cloud, which is shown here in a special color uh, image. You see here the infrared cloud, which has something in the center like four point five micron excess, showing that there's some activity. And this is the new result with Alma on the N two H plus line. Now where you see beautifully the one-to-one -one correspondence with the dark feature on the N2H+. Okay. But the width, I mean, there's a two millimeter source in here, millimeter one is the one that have 500, 550 solar masses, a ten of that, the total mass, and it's a higher millimeter source here. And it's beautiful to see how well, but not surprising, no? The dust feature are dust, but also gas, and there is the gas. Well, it's good to see that uh, with our molecular observation, we also have the velocity field, of course. And uh, this is the velocity field that they derive. You know, they derive uh, this kind of velocity feature, and they, they sort of produce a synthetic velocity field, and there are some correspondence. So they, they claim that the velocity field and the density structure is consistent with the global collapse of the region. So this is type of collapse, is, uh, they say, is a main mechanism for the most for the formation of formal star in the galaxy. That remains to be seen. But at least in this case, it seems to be that uh, very close, no? the, the, the way that uh, gas flows around the filament and falls to the most massive star is very well matched by the observation of the other hand, of the other way. Then we have this observation of a young massive cluster precursor. This is a sort called G0.5, which is a, they have this follow characteristic. They have uh, 10 to 5 solar masses. It's a very cold and less molecular clump that is very near the galactic center, about 100 parsecs of the galactic center. No evidence for star, for a star formation until yesterday when I talked to Luis Felipe, who sent the paper to an archive only two days ago or something. <laughs> Well, they have widespread SIO. Here is a, uh, an image of the SIO, the line profile of SIO. This is a, the, 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 is a call, this is the dark cloud, the dark cloud here at the galaxy center. It's a large one, this is an 8 parsec uh, size. And it's a, it was a, it was a stone for the origin of young massive cluster. Of course, this uh, large massive thing will not form a super massive star, but most likely a cluster of massive star or a cluster of, a cluster of all stars. So it's very important to study that. So Jill uh, proposed uh, this with the, to observe it with the, with the ALMA. And surprisingly to us, we got the time because uh, this is a very large region in the sky, you see. It's, uh, this is about what, uh, five are minutes. So it had to be done with a uh, site We got the time, and I will show you just the result that was, uh, we are getting. Well, the question is, uh, which is the internal structure of the coal and this is called brick, because it's very large, has a large optical depth. Are there filaments, uh, which is the kinematic of this gas in this brick? And this is our result. This is our continuum, two millimeter emission. You can see that it's a wonderful uh, structure, filaments or whatever, and cores and whatever. I think this is for for Lee and for Javier and for Enrique will be a, a gold mine, of course. But also interesting that in the SIO, they also show the same thing, which is very interesting. You know, also a lot of filaments and uh, clubs with SIO. This is only pure light emission on this region. So this is mainly, perhaps it's again, why they seem to be, and the turbulence is very important in this region. There is a gradient in velocity in this direction. But again, it's very close to the galactic center, so perhaps sort of gravity, again, is very important because of the shear forces from the galactic mass there. We don't know, but the results are overtaken, really. So the third object we observe is a massive molecular outflow. Remember when I showed you this molecular outflow with a very large velocity of about 150? Well, very, this is it. We observe it with, the, with ALMA, and we have here uh, maps of uh, the SIO emission, channel maps, going from minus 150 to minus 30, where we can see very nicely, I mean, at the center velocity, 
there is a shell in SIO, no? almost a shell, this is almost no emission there. It's better seen here, it is perhaps in a position velocity diagram. We have here the velocity versus the angular offset, and we clearly see the, the high velocity outflow here, which is a well, high velocity outflow, but also a second component, which is a, we claim is a, we think is an expanding shell. This is just thing that we have been investigating now. And the expansion velocity here is 15 kilometers per second. But uh, with all my beautiful things is that we all observe just one single line, but at the same time, many lines are observed. And we also observe the A13CO plus line, which is supposed to be optically thin. And that's an image of that uh, emission there. That's the emission. And on top, I put in black the SIO emission. And in red, a continuum source that we detected with ASCA. So interesting that uh, the HCO, HCO plus emission falls outside the SIO emission, mainly. Here I show you a spectrum, in fact, of uh, the integrated spectrum of the HCO emission here. And again, this is it. Shows again this line profile the characteristic of a collapsing gas. And from that spectrum, we infer an info velocity of 1.2 kilometers per second. This is the vision from the outflow, okay? So the current picture that uh, we are discussing or make it is the following. It's an expanded SIO shell driven by a stellar wind from a central protostar, the stellar wind that Ed was talking about plus a collapsing outer envelope. So we really here have a class zero object, wonderful. I mean, I think it's very clear. This is a, a, still the ACO plus with a lower density gas. It still is a, the gas that is uh, imported to our, the, the other gas that is produced perhaps by the shocks due to the stellar wind. The SIO typically a tracer of shocks. And the final, don't worry, Salvador, it results in a protoplanetary disk around a massive protostar. This is the one that Rita also mentioned to you. It was here, uh, was a very luminous, 6 times 10 to a 4. Remember, it has a jet on it and uh, associated with bipolar outflow. But uh, here's an image, the SMA image uh, at 2, 30 gigahertz. Uh, perhaps then they have a disk here. Is it a disk or uh, another kind of stuff? And we see the velocity structure. They didn't have much resolution to to prove that, also, of course, they suggested Jim, Jim and Ramiro Franco and Luis Felipe and others that that was a disk. But of course, we have to go to Alma to better resolution, and that's the data I received on Friday, so I was reducing it. And this is a beautiful thing because there is the vision associated with that, it's the same angular scale. So certainly there is a disk here, and this is a second source. That was a problem with this observation that there is a probably lower mass object. But it's a disk. Why I say it's a disk? It's true, it's an extended elongated feature. But we also, of course, got the velocity field. And the velocity field we got it from SO2 observation. And we have a beautiful velocity gradient from minus three, three kilometers per second with a disk of about 500 astronomical units. So this is the most luminous challenge that now known to be associated with a jet, a bipolar outflow, and a rotating, perhaps, accretion disk. The outflow, open, very good question. The outflow is right there, like you know, yeah, perpendicular to this. Right. So just to end, I think we are in a great time, exciting time, in particular for the young mind here, to enter the field because this is the proper time to answer many of the questions I thought. Thank you. A very nice talk, Guido. What you call the pre-stellar massive dense cores, isn't, isn't those the same as the hot cores? No, they are much larger sizes, yes. I will call it, yeah, pre-stellar matrices or whatever. Yes, are much larger. So the hot cores are inside? They are inside, uh, yeah, right. They are supposed to be inside, right. I think that the hot cores is already not pre-stellar. They are already protostellar, because I mean, something had to hit the hot core, and I think it's a, the, the protostellar is producing the luminosity to hit the hot core. In your second AMA example, you showed a large, cool cloud uh, with no sign of star formation. 
yet to observe it in the SIO one. Were you surprised at that? Uh, yes, I, I was surprised to see stuff, but SIO, but I am not surprised to see SIO because SIO are traces of shocks. And, and here you have filaments, and the filaments are colliding. Then, in fact, well, in the convergent filaments and many turbulence, you expect to have some sort of SIO. But it's widespread, so I was completely surprised to shock to see that image, which, in fact, took a lot of uh, reaction time because it was about 40 fields that we put together. So there's a lot of turbulence and dynamics in it, that. Indeed, cool indeed, region. right. And could be caused to the gravitational potential from the galactic center. This is about only 100 passes from the galactic center, from the center of the galaxy. So a lot of shearing forces and things like that. Yes, um, really fascinating stuff, especially these last results. I just wanted to state for the record that about the virial thing, uh, I think it is sort of a myth that uh, we should see those uh, uh, two peak profiles when you have collapsed. That would only apply strictly when you have a, a homogeneous uh, collapse. But when you have much sub substructure inside, it, it might not show at all. I think there's a, a paper by a Korean group, uh, I, I can dig out the reference, in which they did simulations of, uh, of collapsing cores with turbulence superposed on them. And in general, they found that only a small fraction of those actually showed the, the info signature. And some of them even seem to show uh, like outflows and things like reverse peak. Uh, yeah, so, but in the simulations. So uh, just to say that when you do have substructure, perhaps you don't have that clear signature. Yeah, I sort of tend to agree with what you say, like 80%. <laughs> Yes, it's true because uh, we, we already say that, uh, remember, it's only 4% of uh, the massive that score that uh, Diego study was uh, 640 showed this kind of collapse. The other ones were completely Gaussian, so it looks like they are in equilibrium. So why? I mean, you, you are uh, claiming that all those things are collapsing, so why 96% are, are just coming out? So I agree with the sense that this is special. It looks like they are in fold, they are more symmetrical, whatever, but. Uh, I doubt it that, that you can you can produce this kind of line without. Well, would you say that those uh, eighty percent of the uh, cores have no internal structure? Have not? No, 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 no. I will not say. I think that we need to to I to say that. Really, you know, that. Right. No, there could be collapsing. Yes. Structure, yeah. You won't see right. The, the of the or right. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think that's the other thing is a Gaussian profile, but I, I saw I told you that one of the questions that we need to answer is to study the structure of this course to see what they are going on. Right. Uh, Guido, this uh, cloud uh, actually that uh, Al has asked about, uh, I was wondering, you got a very large mass for that, right? 10 to the 5 solar masses. 10 to the 5 solar masses. But what uh, distance do you assume for that cloud? Uh, it's about uh, 8, eight kiloparsec. Uh, I have not been uh, uh, deriving those, but I was told it's about half the parsec from the galactic center. Okay. So, and mm -hmm. perhaps the Lippe knows uh, better than yeah, it's supposed to be within 100 parsecs of the galactic center. It has a very large uh, uh, about radial velocity. And in that direction, if you have large radial velocity, it probably means that you throw the galactic center. But, yeah, I mean, I, I was surprised that, though, because I mean, if you see it in absorption, it at eight microns, I mean, it's you know, it's blocking out a background radiation, and it's that far away. It's uh, you know, it's very, be very unusual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree, yes, but that's the way it looks. It is, but again, uh, it's important that uh, in fact there is some star formation now because uh, the paper with Felipe say that there are a couple of three B three stars there. Perhaps there are jets, no, but uh, something is going on there, but very little compared yes. to the mass there. But again, a lot of SIO, a lot seems to be chocks are very important uh, too. Yeah, I'd like to return to my favorite topic, magnetic <laughs> fields. Uh, I think most people would uh, say that uh, jets and collimated outflows are not possible without magnetic fields. I think most people would also agree it's very hard to get disk accretion without magnetic fields. Maybe if they're massive enough, you could do it with gravitational towards, but typically these disks don't look massive enough for that. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, it's an open question whether magnetic fields are important for cores or not, okay? 
But I would remind everybody that magnetic fields have a wonderful predictive aspect. And that is in high mass stars, things happen so quickly. There's no time for the flux to be lost. So there's memory, okay? And in principle, if there is that memory, we should be able to trace the magnetic field from cores to disks to outflows. And we could work hard on that, you know, to right. see whether that memory is preserved. 